He's somebody that I met this summer when I was teaching a cybersecurity camp, and uh, he gets to deal with the crossover between law and cybersecurity. Um, he's a trial lawyer with extensive civil and criminal experience in courts across the country. Uh, he's a former federal prosecutor, and um, he has significant trial and motions experience prosecuting computer crimes, public corruption, fraud, money laundering, and transnational organized crime. So um, he doesn't have something projected, but he's going to be kind of discussing with you uh, some of the ins and outs of uh, his work. So thank you. Hi, guys. Um, so before, like 150 years before the tech boom, there was the gold rush. And both of them transformed the Bay Area. Um, <clears throat> the San Francisco 49ers are actually named after 49ers were 1849. All these people went to the Bay Area, to San Francisco, to basically try to make their fortunes, try and find gold. Um, and in the same way that the tech industry has transformed uh, that same area. And in very much the same way, there's kind of this whole ecosystem that came up around the gold rush. And one of the most memorable people, actually, uh, who was a part of that was not like a gold miner, he didn't pan for gold. He wasn't involved directly in the kind of gold industry. Uh, but he was this dude who ran a dry goods store. And his name was Levi Strauss. And a dry goods store is basically a clothing goods store. So he, this is a guy who ran an Old Navy. Um, in the gold rush, and today we wear we wear his jeans. Um, and he wasn't even the guy who <clears throat> kind of came up with the idea for jeans. We had these miners who are who are digging for gold, and their pants are falling apart when they're doing it because they're not sturdy enough to take the stress of it. And they're going to this guy named Jakob Davis, and he's like, "I can help you guys out." I can make these pants for you that aren't gonna fall off because it takes a lot of gold to make up for the fact that your pants are falling off when you walk out of a gold mine. Um, <clears throat> and his innovation was that he's like, he used copper rivets to fasten the weak parts of the pants. He didn't have money to patent his invention, so he went to Levi Strauss and he said, hey, let's go in on this together. Today, Levi is the guy that we know. Now, Levi was a guy who didn't have either the resources, the ability, the skills, the knowledge to participate in the gold rush, but he was part of this gold rush ecosystem. He was like gold rush adjacent, basically. And he's one of the guys that we remember today. And I say this because that's basically the position that I'm in. I'm not a web developer. Uh, I don't code. I'm not an engineer. I don't make an app. But I'm in kind of the tech ecosystem, tech adjacent, basically. Um, today, I'm a data privacy lawyer. Uh, before that, I prosecuted computer crimes as a federal prosecutor. Uh, but that's kind of the end of my story. Let me tell you how I got there, and then we can talk about <coughs> a few of the issues uh, that are coming up in <coughs> tech policy, and tech law. So I um, went to college, had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, and at the time, my dad suggested, hey, you should take a computer science class. This may be big someday. Um, so I did and really struggled in it, was not very good at programming, uh, somehow made it through. I uh, did an internship at NASA where I was working on the Mars rover and some of the heuristic programming for that and absolutely hated it. It was in LA, in California, beautiful days. I'm stuck in a room with no windows, just a bank of computers. And it's basically just me and kind of the, the senior guy and we're trying to figure out the answer to some of these problems. Um, so I went back and I thought, this isn't for me. I'm still interested in some of the issues. So ended up getting a computer science degree, 
also got a degree in policy. And then, uh, you know, if I want to be in tech policy, I should go to DC. Essentially papered DC with my resume, which is not the right way of doing it. Um, but uh, did that, ended up getting a job with a, uh, a member of Congress from Silicon Valley. <clears throat> Started working in tech policy, uh, went to law school, was on the Obama campaign, and then became a federal prosecutor prosecuting computer crimes. Um, and computer crimes is, is, a, is a big topic, so let me tell you about one of the cases that I had, and then um, I'm gonna ask you guys a bunch of questions, um, and we can hopefully have a, have a conversation about, um, about law and tech. So one of the cases I had was we had a guy um, in the Atlanta area who was uh, hacking into athletes and celebrities' iCloud accounts. So he would find publicly available information for them and reset their passwords, go in, and he would then have access to their contacts, their photographs, their emails, kind of all the information that would be in their iCloud accounts. Uh, and he would use that and he would start getting in touch with people. So, um, so he did that. Apple started noticing that, there, hey, there's a lot of access here for a lot of people coming from one IP address. They contacted the FBI, who got in touch with us. We started looking at it. <clears throat> they sent us a list of people who, had, um, who they thought had been hacked into. So at one point, I'm sitting at my computer, and in front of me, I have um, all of Nicki Minaj's contact information. I got LeBron James. I have Jalen Hurts. And I have all these guys that um, this guy has basically hacked into their accounts. And what he was doing was he was looking at, uh, so let's take, one of the people was actually, was Kevin Durant. So let's take him for example. He would go into Kevin's, Kevin Durant's contacts and he would say, and he would go and he would just, he would get in touch with people that Kevin Durant knew and try to strike up a relationship with them. And in that way he would get close to these players and athletes. So let's start here. Um, well, let's start here. Is what he's doing, is what he's doing right or wrong? Anyone have an opinion? Should he be doing this? See you nodding your head? Shaking my head. Shaking your head, you're saying no, he shouldn't be doing this? No. Why not? Because it's a breach of privacy. Okay. Um, which part is a breach of privacy? Probably looking through his contacts, like, like, you mentioned hacking, that's not a good thing in most scenarios. Okay, uh, so, okay, so let's talk about this hacking, right? Um, now he is using publicly available information to reset <coughs> people's passwords. So it, are we considering that hacking? Actually, probably wouldn't be hacking that if it's publicly available. Okay. Um, so do we think that is, that, is that what we think as a group? That this is not hacking? Yes? So what parts of, it's, of their information is public? So for, yeah. If you use the pieces of public information to then hack into something else, mm -hmm. then it's still hacking. Okay. Uh, so what do you mean by use the pieces of public information to hack in? Like if you have to do any like like tweaking the technology around their personal accounts, mm -hmm. you can use their like username or whatever, but you have to reset you have to reset the password somehow. Right. Which means that you're trying to access their own personal information. Yeah, so here here's what he would do. <clears throat> he would call up Apple and they have, you know, security questions like, Hey, I'm Kevin Durant. Uh, that should have been a first tip off for Apple. Um, but uh, I need to reset my password. And they would say, okay, so you, know, you have security questions. What high school did you go to? Um, what was the name of your first pet? Um, what was your first car, right? <clears throat> and in a lot of these cases, he would be able to answer those questions using 
publicly available information. So what, what do you think about that then? And it wouldn't be hacking for the cell phone. Okay, so it's not hacking. Do we agree with this, not hacking? No, what do you think? It's still a violation of confidentiality of this account information and the account itself. Okay, so what do you mean by violation of the confidentiality? Okay, so what if he doesn't change anything? So he changes the password. He doesn't change anything in the account itself. What do you think? It's technically not hacking, but as soon as he changes something, it is. Okay, so... Um, so we can... You say, it sounds like we have, we have several people who say that it's not hacking. Um, is it still something that should be uh, legal to do? I'm seeing some nods. Anyone, anyone want to speak up? So the law around this is that you're not allowed to exceed whatever uh, the authorized access is. Um, so in this case, this guy had no authorized access to Kevin Durant's account. He was exceeding the amount of access that he was allowed to have, um, which is what allowed us to prosecute him under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is the main uh, kind of computer crime statute on the books. But this can lead to um, other types of problems. So. This is a bit of a different issue. Uh, this was a recent case where, uh, so this is a divorce case, and the, um, the wife, so during this divorce, the wife tells the husband, or tells the court, hey, my husband was cheating on me uh, all throughout our marriage. And the husband says, mm, prove it. Always a dangerous position to be in. Um, the wife comes back and says, here are all these emails between you and whoever it was that you were cheating on me with. Um, that's how I can show that uh, you were cheating on me. And it comes out <coughs> uh, during the case that she had set up a rule on his email. So whenever he got an email, it would be forwarded to her. Right? And whenever he sent an email, it would be forwarded to her. And the husband's lawyer said, actually, wait a minute. You are intercepting communications. That's a violation of the Federal Wiretap Act. So what do we think about that? Should she be able to set up a rule on his email so that she gets all his emails? <coughs> wait a minute, you're shaking your head no. She shouldn't be able to do that? No? How come? It, you think it's a violation of the husband's privacy? Yeah. yeah. I mean, she, she had, yes. I, I think she shouldn't be able to do it without, like, permission. Without permission. Well, she got into her husband's account somehow. Presumably, she had his password. Now, is that enough permission to set up that kind of rule? No, I'm seeing a lot of no's. So where does that permission end then? If you give someone the password to your email, or really to anything, how much permission have you given them? Yes. So you haven't given them permission, but you have given them the opportunity. Should the husband here be able to say, hey, you can't use any of this stuff against me? Yes. Well, did she have his password and then log on to his account, or did he leave his account open on the computer that she didn't look at? What's the difference between the two? 
if he gives her her his password like <coughs> intentionally, then it's kind of giving his consent to be able to see his account. But if he leaves it up like on his personal computer and she's like snooping, then that's definitely a. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now let's say you're at home and you have, um, you know, you guys still use binders. Yeah, but still uses binders. Okay, you have a binder, you have stuff in it that you don't want your brother, mom, dad to see, but you leave it in the kitchen, right? And someone goes through it. Uh, now it's in a common space. Um, so is that? What do you think? What do you think about that? Like okay, it's a tough question. It's a tough question to know uh, exactly how much authority you're giving someone, um, and it depends a lot on the various facts involved. So, if it's in the kitchen versus your bedroom, that probably makes a difference. In the kitchen, you might expect someone to say to go through your things to see just what is this. Not even for like any malicious reason, but just curious. <clears throat> what is this? What's, what's it doing here? Um, and so, if we take a step back from this divorce example, um, what the wife is doing is really exposing some wrongdoing by her husband. He's like, you were, you were the one who's cheating on me. Why shouldn't I be able to use this evidence that I have against you? You're the one in the wrong here. I'm the one who figured it out. Um, even stepping away from the law, should she be able to use this? Yes? Did she have the password? I'm sorry? Did she have the password? Uh, you know, I don't know if she had the password. But, but tell me what you think. Let's say, let's say she didn't have the password. Let's say his computer was up. She starts looking, she's looking at, you know, his computer's up. It's in their bedroom. She needs to use the computer. She goes on and she sees a message from uh, someone she doesn't know, and she, look, you know, it's just up on her on the computer, and she sets up this rule, right? So she realizes that her husband is cheating on her. She says, "I need to find out more about this." What do you think about that? So in this case. Um, what the court said was, look, this might be a violation of the, of the federal wiretap statute. The wiretap statute says you are not allowed to intercept an oral wire or electronic communication from someone. And this may have violated that. <coughs> and there was one judge, uh, who's actually a pretty influential judge, she said, that is crazy. This woman is exposing, uh, activity that we don't want to, uh, to promote in our society. We don't want to promote people cheating on each other. And she's exposing this activity. This, is the, this guy was cheating, he has no right to privacy in this, um, in this activity that we don't want people to do. And she should be able uh, to do that. So let's bring this home a little bit. Everyone here has a phone, I'm guessing? Yes? Uh, how many people's parents have put like, the, uh, the tracking stuff, tracking app on your phone, or can see what you're doing. All right, not so different from this scenario, right? So what do we think about that? Are, they, are your parents committing a federal felony when they do that? What? You can commit a fel felony against a minor. Yeah. Okay, so does... does mm -hmm. Okay. Does the person's intent matter when they're doing this? Yeah. Okay. Why? Because, like, if you're doing it for bad reasons, like, it could be to, like, hurt you, but if you're doing it for, like, good reasons, then, mm -hmm. like, if you say how to be hurtful. Okay. So who gets to decide what are the good reasons and what are the bad reasons? Um, it's 
it's a tough question. Um, in general, you know, the courts have decided, and sometimes uh, lawmakers decide what are good reasons and bad reasons. I, I think in a lot of these cases, <clears throat> um, we don't try to differentiate between good reasons and bad reasons. We don't try to apply value judgments to what is happening. Um, because uh, what you want in the law and in policy are kind of neutral applications of it. You want to know in every situation if I'm putting a um, if I'm putting an app on your phone that, that tells me what's uh, everything that you're doing. I want to know uh, what I want to know whether I'm going to be liable for that or not. Now I think the difference with your phones is that it's probably with your consent. Is that right? Um, so consent is one of the things that can, uh, you know, if you consent to uh, allowing someone to have your password, to have information on your phone, uh, that can make a difference there. Um, so those are some of the legal applications. Let's talk. <clears throat> Let's talk about some of the uh, policy implications of um, of, kind of technology and privacy and data. <clears throat> so, do people still use Facebook? Yes, kind of, maybe, no. Okay, what about Instagram? Yes. All right. Okay. Um, so. Uh, Instagram, uh, this was Facebook, but let's imagine that this was Instagram doing this, would randomly selected some users and said, we're going to run a research experiment on these users. So for a randomly selected group of users, we are going to show you only sad images. And we're going to see what kind of impact that has on you. And for this other set of users, we're going to show you only like happy, positive images. And we're going to see what kind of impact it has on these people. So should Instagram <clears throat> be allowed to run these kinds of experiments on their users? Yes? Not without the user's consent. OK, so let's talk about consent here. Um, anyone read the licensing agreement when you sign on to Instagram? No, of course not. Would you be surprised if uh, part of that agreement said, hey, you give us consent to do research on you? You would be surprised? You would not be surprised. You should not be surprised, because that's exactly what the license agreement says. It says we can run any sort of experiment, experiment that we want to run here. Does that constitute consent? Yeah? Once you check that box, you can sign anything away? What do we think? Yes? So like almost every, uh, anything, social media apps would ever have a, an agreement that you have to say like, yeah, this is okay. But if you don't read it, you're still accepting the terms even if you don't know what they are. That's right. So you're giving consent even though you don't know you're giving consent to. Right, is, is that real consent though? Is it consent if you don't know what you're giving your consent to? I think that they expect, by checking the box, you're saying that you read it. Right. And so they're taking that expectation, and even if you didn't read it, they're using that as your consent. So usually it says, I have read the terms and conditions. Yep. So if you're, you would be lying, which almost everybody does, mm -hmm. um, by checking that box, if you haven't read it, so you'd be at fault. Okay, so so they do they do make you say, yeah, I've read and understood all of the terms in this agreement. Um, is that a reasonable? Is it reasonable for them to expect that you do that? No. Not as, not even if it's one page. Um, so. Have you kind of effectively given consent there? 
just because you say, sure, I want to use your product, I have to do, I have to read the, I have to sign this thing in order to use it. Is that valid consent? I mean, in terms of somebody like thinking, like, oh, this is wrong doing, mm -hmm. because I wasn't aware of this, they said that they work. So, right. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so this is uh, this is another uh, area, both, area of both law and policy where <clears throat> there are a lot of contracts that are considered unconscionable because um, basically one party has all the power. If you want to use this product, you have to sign away all of your rights. Um, and uh, of course, I said that's not always consent, and it depends a lot on the various facts that go into it, but. Um, that is not always consent when you do that. Um, but even kind of taking a step back from that, you know, this is a product, Instagram, something that you use every day. Um, should they be running experiments on their users with, with this kind of consent? Shouldn't they have a little pop-up that comes up and says, hey, you've been randomly selected for this study. Do you want to participate? I'm sorry? Okay. So what's more important here? Is it the value of the experiment or is it having some sort of informed consent uh, from the users? Well, if you read it or not, you still check the box and then consented to it. So either way, you still agree to let them do it. So okay. You say once you've agreed in the experiment, Okay. What uh, what's the line here? In in this type of agreement, what can you not give up? What if you agreed to, um, you know, give up your firstborn? Could they make you do that? I mean, you signed the agreement, right? I mean, that's a ridiculous example, obviously. But what is the line? So they can run experiments on you, that's what I'm hearing. What can they not do, even though they put it into that agreement? Yes? Using anything that contradicts the law. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Um, you think running an experiment on you without your knowledge, should that be, you have an opinion on whether that should be legal or illegal? Well, is it right now? Uh, it's a good question, I don't know whether it is or not. Um, what do you think it should be, though? It's really hard because in order for a, like you were saying, in order for an experiment, or like an experiment to go like the way you want it, you, people can't be aware that they're being tested on. Well, so that part is actually, when you're part of an experiment, you know that you're part of the experiment. You don't necessarily know which group you're in. Yeah, like they'll give you like a placebo. Or That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Um, so typically when you're in an experiment, you know that you're participating and you've always agreed or volunteered to be a part of it. Um, so, am I getting close? You got about a few more minutes. So. Okay. Um, any questions before I go? Or what questions do you have? Yeah. I'm glad we solved everything here. <laughs> this has been good. So can your teachers experiment on you as long as we put a terms and conditions in the syllabus that you also don't read? <laughs> that's that's yeah. cool now, right? I just put that line in my syllabus. Should we start modifying our syllabus? Yeah. <laughs> well, I already did. We're good. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> well, so I can then do whatever I want, right? Because because you, you read the syllabus. <laughs> so I can maybe randomly assign whether or not you want to pull your grade out of a hat or actually make it based on your work. That's okay. Yeah. Right. So let me, right. let me just leave you with, oh, sorry. Yes, question. <coughs> I'm sorry? 
Uh, I can't actually talk about what happened because that part was not public. <laughs> the rest of it was. So, um, I mean, he was prosecuted. You don't have to worry about it. <laughs> um, so the last question I'll, I'll leave you with is, so in this experiment, um, where, where uh, Instagram doesn't tell you that you're part of this experiment, um, what if you show really sad pictures to someone and they go out, yeah, I've heard it here somewhere. What if they go out and kill themselves? They didn't even know that they were, they were part of this experiment. And uh, that's the result. So something to think about as you're thinking about consent, uh, what should be uh, required of companies and people who are um, you know, kind of selling you the products and what kind of privacy requirements should be in place. Thank you.